Hi class, welcome to chapter eight on Africans. This chapter is very interesting. Obviously Africa though is a very, very large area geographically, so it's quite difficult to generalize and summarize all of the dietary beliefs and practices of one gigantic continent into such a small lecture. Therefore, this is just to serve as an overview. Like some of the other chapters in the book, this one is not without unfortunate stereotypes. Um, and so I apologize if anyone is offended. That is not my intent. Again, I am speaking from the text, not my own personal opinion. All right. So cultural perspectives. Like I said, Africa is a huge continent that you can see here. And because it is such a large continent, there are many different climates as well as geographic type environments. There is desert, there is jungle, there's rainforest, um, and even some Mediterranean type environments uh, up in kind of Northern Africa area. It is home to the largest desert in the world. It's the second largest continent in the world and it's estimated that 1 billion people live here. There is a long history of Africans in the US, and unfortunately this history is not always a positive one. Slavery was present before Africans immigrated intentionally to the US, and the arrival of indentured servants had preceded even the arrival of the Mayflower to the United States of America. There were estimated to be half a million people who were immigrated and imported against their wills. These people were often ripped apart from their families, separated from their families, and forced to work as slaves or indentured servants. In America, slaves often lived on the edges of plantations, and I already mentioned in the Native American chapter that this is where they commonly interacted, shared cooking, um, and kind of coerced with Native American populations. Movement to free the slaves began as early as the 1800s, starting in the 1830s, and in this time the northern states began pushing to end slavery. In the 1800s, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and this happened during the Civil War. It was issued by him and proclaimed freedom in the 10 states where there was still rebellion. Then the 13th Amendment was signed in 1864 and 1865, and abolished, this abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment. So that was a huge win for African Americans. They still were not equal, even though we had the laws of separate but equal. And so luckily in the 1960s, those laws were overturned. However, if you have ever turned on the news or social media, you can still see that there is a lot of discrimination and inequality today, unfortunately. History, 55% of African Americans live in the South today. This is actually interesting because traditionally African Americans avoided the South since slavery was so prevalent there, but more recently we're having more Blacks actually moving from the North to the South because they feel more comfortable there in the climate um, as well as with other people. Poverty rates for African Americans are still high. They have twice the rate of poverty of non-Hispanic Americans, and uh, their unemployment rate is double, their medium incomes as lower, and many children live in poverty. So this is very, very sad. This is a map of where African Americans are living within the United States. So you can see that the greatest populations of African Americans are living in uh, kind of the southern and southeastern United States. So Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, etc. There's a small sprinkling in the Bay Area of California. There are no black colors here or blue. Um, however, there's still this yellow and kind of tan color and that represents up to 12 and a half percent. So it's not like there are none, um, but definitely you can see some trends in this map. Worldview. 
So spirituality was very important to black slaves as they came across to the U.S. and is continues to be important to Africans and African Americans. The first black church was founded in the 1770s, but only really became popular because it helped with the anti-slavery movement. The church is important for people who did convert to Christianity, and now many African Americans do belong to a church. Immigrants from northern areas in Africa were actually more likely to be Muslim. Immigrants from southern and sub-Saharan Africa are more likely to be Christian. Family and extended family are and continue to be very important, and they were. Unfortunately, like I mentioned, sometimes families were broken up during the slave trade, and so often a biological parent or child was stolen or sold into slavery, and so extended families became even more important. Women do work in the United States, but they're also expected to maintain the family life. Life is viewed as energy rather than matter, and people interact with many forces. Some of these forces include God, the environment, nature, the living, and the dead. Health is maintained by living in harmony. They do believe in the evil eye as well as many different spirits. For example, even if it is explained to a patient that they have malaria because a mosquito who was carrying malaria has stung them, they still would like to know why that mosquito chose to sting them versus somebody else. And the only answer that is acceptable is that somebody had sent or caused the mosquito to sting that particular individual. Traditional health beliefs and practice continued. So often they define health as more than freedom from illness, and I would agree with their extended definition, but ability to support a family, fulfill societal obligations, and maintain social and emotional well-being. I hope that that is important to all of us. They do believe in voodoo, and voodoo doctors are still prevalent, and voodoo is still practiced. Voodoo doctors can cure unnatural illnesses through casting spells, use of magic, use of magic powders, animal bones, teeth, stones, or herbs. And if given the opportunity, many African Americans will try a home remedy first, and over 50% actually participate in traditional rituals. Foods that were common to African Americans and historical influence. So they were brought over as slaves and indentured servants. Some ships that brought them over actually had special diets for them that were native to their land, and so that was very good. However, they were introduced to New World foods, and the New World foods, or foods that were in the Americas, included things like cassava, corn, chili, peanuts, pumpkin, and tomato. So cassava, corn, chili, peanuts, pumpkin, and tomato. They combined these with foods that were traditional to West Africa, so foods that they normally ate, such as sesame, watermelon, and black-eyed peas, which are pictured here. Frying was a common cooking method, as well as boiling and roasting. So we're going to look at some different regional cuisines from different parts of Africa. I would say that all parts of Africa do depend on locally grown foods. However, different parts may have greater access to imports and um, closeness to other fertile locations. Staples varied by location, but were generally very starchy. They included corn, millet, rice, yams, plantains, and insects. So they commonly actually ate termites and locusts, and those are actually still considered a treat. Chickens are considered prestigious, and they weren't necessarily eaten. Those were considered for a special occasion, and they were often traded or saved. They would boil down starchy veggies and pound them into a paste called fufu. I have a video about fufu, which I'd like you to watch. The fufu paste is then used kind of as a utensil. It's rolled in one's hand and formed into a dough ball, and so it can be used to scoop up other foods. Legumes are very popular. Okra, pumpkin, eggplant is also very popular. Millet, sorghum, and plantains are staples in Somalia and Sudanese, Ethiopian, and Eritrean uh, areas of Africa. Coffee is a big exported crop. 
They do eat chicken here, so chicken is not as prestigious as it is in West Africa, um, in Somalia, the Sudanese, Ethiopian, and Eritrean areas. Many people from Ethiopia practice vegetarianism, and what is the national dish of Ethiopia? So this is not a misspelling. It is supposed to be spelled this way. And this is a thick, spicy stew that includes meats and legumes. Honey is common, and camel milk is also common. This is a picture of some Ethiopian food. This is an Ethiopian bread um, called in. I believe it's called injera, injera bread or injeri bread. Um, it's a very, very thin bread. It is commonly made with teff, which is a type of grain, a very, very small fiber grain. And it has lots of holes in there because there are live bacteria in the dough that help ferment and create these gas pockets. It's very thin, kind of like a crepe. It's that thinness. It's a little bit sticky and it has a kind of a sourdough type taste. And this injera bread can be used again as a utensil or a serving device. So you could, you know, rip off a small piece of this bread and pick up some food with it. And that's what was being done here. So this is actually in one of my classes. Um, in my face-to-face -face classes, we have oral presentations about cultures. And so one group actually brought in some of this bread as well as some African stews. Uh, you see an egg here, some greens, and we were able to sample this bread in the traditional way. This is just another picture of the bread. Here it's being used kind of as a serving plate and here's the wedges of it that could be used for scooping up the food. Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. So again, you see some of the very similar staple crops, very starchy crops, um, beans, nuts, cassava, corn, millet, and plantains. They also grow coffee here. They do consider cows sacred and a gift from the gods, and they're mostly vegetarians. Breads are very common, so you might have a bread that's similar to what we just saw. They also have a dish called ugali, and this is a very thick, doughy cornmeal porridge that's shown in this picture here and is quite a staple. South Africa is known for temperate climates, so rich fruits and vegetables can grow. They do enjoy chutneys, which are usually made from slightly pickled fruits and are served kind of as jellies, often on top of meats. They have a dish called boboti, and it's a meatloaf flavored with curry and custard, and it's pictured here. And then North Africa. I actually I had a map wow. of... I don't know what why might be considered North Africa. So I recently visited Morocco, which is a tiny little pink section on the map. Um, okay, so I don't know exactly why that slide talked to us, but like I said, I had a chance um, two years ago when I was pregnant with my son, I was barely pregnant, to visit Morocco. It was not part of the planned trip to be pregnant in Morocco, but so it was. And so uh, we were, Morocco is in the northern part of Africa, and I got to experience some of the African culture in Morocco as well as taste some of the food. So that was really great. This was some Moroccan breakfasts. There's two different breakfasts here, including the placemat and the table setting, which I thought was really interesting. They did serve orange juice, which is always fresh squeezed. They do not usually serve it from um, a cardboard package. They usually fresh squeeze it, even at the smallest restaurants. And they did serve this milk, which I was a little hesitant to drink, uh, and it did taste a little different, but I still tried it. Um, in the upper picture was a buffet breakfast I went to, and they had all sorts of things, very different than your typical buffet breakfast here. This looks more like a buffet lunch but it was served for breakfast. They had different cold cuts, they had onions, they had carrots, they had garbanzo beans, they had olives, they had sweets, they had fruits, they had pastries, they had meats. It was just a little bit different. And then you can also see the spread of different jams and chutneys as well as bread that's being served. These are two different salads I got. Um, Moroccans really like salad, but this is how they do salad. So if you may notice, there is no lettuce in either of these pictures. In fact, I don't think I ever ate lettuce while I was in Morocco. Their salads are more relish-like or more salsa-like. 
they're usually tomatoes, onions, carrots, cucumbers, beets, olives, bell peppers, etc. all cut up and served together. Sometimes they had kind of a vinaigrette-like sauce and sometimes they didn't. So these were the salads. And you can tell that they take a lot of care into making their dishes very artistic. Neither of these were at fancy restaurants. They were just at very standard restaurants. This is a typical dish from Morocco. In the upper part of the page is a picture that I took and a food that I actually ate. Um, and then the lower part is something that I got online, but it shows how the dish is cooked. So this is called a tagine, and it is very common in Morocco. They traditionally have clay tagines, and it's kind of a one-pot cooking method. They will add vegetables, meat, onion, broth, different seasonings, and then they will put this usually in a large oven and the entire thing cooks together. The juices um, evaporate up to the top of the tajim and then kind of roll down the side so it becomes very juicy and the meat becomes very tender, and it was very good. And then this was a very interesting meal that I got in the Sahara. Um, I have to admit I, I didn't particularly like this meal, but I still found that it was very interesting. You can see I had carrots. I had some brown rice with a very odd kind of chutney on it. It was a date chutney. The thing with the egg in it is actually a baked potato, which has been hollowed out. The potato part was remashed, and then they refilled it and then put that egg in there. And then kind of this pastry, meaty looking thing was a very odd combination of pastry crust, noodles, and some sort of meat and vegetables all kind of cooked together. Um, I had very much, very many other really delicious foods on the trip, but these are just some I took a picture of. Another interesting thing I found when I was traveling is very, very few places served anything cold. You never received ice with a drink, and if you ordered a soda or a juice, it did not come cold. Um, so refrigeration was not a common thing. And I think we will stop here for this section and then move. Okay, so that was from a, a previous lecture that I did, but I let it play through because it had the pertinent information from my trip to Morocco. Um, if you ever have the chance to go to Morocco, I highly recommend it. Some of the places we stayed were very affordable. The food in general was very good. It was a very interesting cultural location, beautiful art, beautiful people, beautiful scenery, um, et cetera. Many ruins and the desert, um, camels, just so many interesting things to see there. So the slave diet. The slave diet uh, was the diet that slaves ate, as it sounds like. And this would depend on which plantation they were at and what was grown on their plantation as well as what their owners provided. So for example, many slave plantations provided all sorts of foods for the slave and some slave plantations did not provide very many foods at all. So often they used what they could. They often planted their own small gardens and hunted and gathered the surrounding areas. They often found possums, rabbits, raccoons, squirrels, and pigs, as well as caught catfish to add to their diets. Usually salt pork was provided to them, as well as molasses and salted fish. Okay, sorry about that, and my recording paused for a minute. Anyways, the slaves did eat a lot of pork. I already mentioned that they had salt pork. They would catch hogs, and they would, if the slaves caught them themselves, they could enjoy them, but if the plantation owners caught them, they would give the slaves kind of the less desired parts, such as the chitlins, which were the intestines, which they would fry, the maw, which was the stomach lining, and the tail and the noses. They still considered chickens prestigious, um, and they used pork in just about everything they ate. Food being portable was very important because they were working during the day, so if food wasn't portable, it pretty much meant they weren't eating 
One dish that was portable was vegetable stews. They would also make fried cakes such as hush puppies. They would make something called hoe cakes, which were cornmeal cakes prepared on the back of a hoe stuck over the fire and heated up and could be stuffed in a backpack or uh, a pocket or wrapped in a little bit of cloth to take with them. They do have a preference for sticky foods, such as porridges, grits, stews, and soups thickened with okra, if you haven't kind of noticed by now. They do have a preference for pork, corn, and pork products, and these are considered staples. They also enjoy greens, and greens are definitely um, a staple part of their diet. They're not just plain greens, though, as we would think of like healthy leafy greens. They start out healthy, but then they're added uh, salt pork, fat, bacon, ham, and sometimes butter or lard. When they enjoyed pigs, like I said, they ate all parts of the pigs. I mentioned the tails, the chitterlings. They would also eat the, fit, the feet and the ears. Meal pattern. So typical meal pattern was two meals a day and snacks. Snacks remain common for Africans and Africans American, and meals were generally communal. In poorer countries, the morning meal was replaced with a snack and only dinner was served, so then it would just be one meal a day. Sometimes men were served first, sometimes men ate without the children. During lunch or dinner, it was common to have a dessert, such as a baked item, um, and uh, immigrants have kind of changed their meal patterns, so instead they have three meals a day, generally speaking. Special occasions. Sunday dinner was something that was traditionally special and started in the slave period and continues to be special today. Um, they start cooking early in the morning. The entire family will come. Close friends, neighbors are invited to enjoy the feast. They typically cook fried chicken, spare ribs, chitterlings, which remember are pork intestines, pig intestines that are fried. They make pig's feet, black-eyed peas, corn, cornbread, potatoes, salad, and rice. So it really is quite a delicious meal. Kwanzaa is a relatively new celebration, and this is actually created in California in the 1900s and celebrates and recognizes the African diaspora as well as the unity of all people of African heritage. And each day they light a candle, and it's meant to symbolize one of seven principles, unity, self-determination, collective work, responsibility, purpose, creativity, and faith. And I do recommend you watching my Kwanzaa video. They have special child naming cer ceremonies, and at a child naming ceremony, it's important for these six different ingredients to be present. Um, Water represents purity, oil represents power and health, alcohol represents wealth and prosperity, honey represents happiness, cola nuts represent good fortune, and salt represents intelligence and wisdom. People of the South, uh, especially African Americans, believe in Southern hospitality. They will cook large meals. The meals are traditions for social catalysts, social interaction, and everybody would be invited and expected to partake. In areas where they do not use utensils, the right hand is used for eating, as is very common in other cultures as well. Therapeutic uses of foods. So they believe in concepts of high blood and low blood, and this is different than blood pressure. High blood um, is thought to be caused by excess blood migrating to one part of the body, such as your head, meaning it's high up, and it can be due to eating excessive amounts of rich foods, sweet foods, or red colored foods. Low blood is associated with anemia, which means you don't have enough blood or not enough red blood cells, so that does make quite a bit of sense. And this can be caused by eating too many astringent or acidic foods and not enough meat. Something called pica is often experienced by African and African American cultures and most often women. However, this could occur in men. And pica is eating non-food items. Common non-food items are chalk, clay, laundry starch, even ice would be considered pica, and dirt. 
and it happens a lot in pregnancy. It's not exactly explained, but the thought is that it's meant to, the body is seeking out something to cure deficiency. Like the body senses that it's deficient in a certain nutrient or mineral, and so it seeks out these foods to try to cure it. Obviously, if you ate something like this entire cutlery set, that would probably do a lot much more harm than good and would not cure any sort of deficiency, would most likely cause some malabsorption. It's interesting that they had pica because they also believed that clay prevented birthmarks and starch made the skin of the baby lighter and helped the baby slip out during pregnancy. And lighter skin um, as well as lack of birthmarks was something that was often desired. Cultural adaptations. Milk was uncommon. However, now people are drinking more milk, even though there is a really high rate of lactose intolerance, up to 95%. Um, meats, pork is still popular. However, there are less variety cuts, such as the tails and the nose and the chitterlings. Cereals and grains, store-bought breads, processed grains, sugar-sweetened cereals often replace traditional grains. Seasonings, not much has changed. They use hot pepper sauces, onions, and green pepper. Sweets that are common, honey, molasses, and sugar were traditional. However, now cookies and candies were preferred, are preferred. Cultural adaptations. So there are more fast food restaurants in black neighborhoods than any other neighborhoods. This leads to high intake of fat foods, high intake of saturated fats, sugar sweetened beverages. You may have heard of something called soul food. Soul food includes fresh meats and vegetables that are made from scratch and thoroughly cooked and love is put into the cooking of these foods. Different foods reflect socioeconomic status, geographic location, and work versus heritage, which was a traditional way for foods to have their origin. Um, people no longer ID traditional foods as being African, so you no longer, people are no longer IDing okra as being African, yams as being African, or one-pot meal, such as that tajim as being African. However, they do still recognize greens as being African. Nutritional status. Unfortunately, the nutritional status of African Americans is very poor. They have high intakes of saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium. They have higher rates of diabetes, obesity, um, prenatal nutrition, as well as maternal and child nutrition is very poor. Their life expectancy is significantly lower, about four years for both men and women. And weight gain is attributed to many things. Cultural, they do prefer slightly bigger bodies, but also income, education, environment that promotes high fast food intake. I just said there's more fast food restaurants in the neighborhoods where African Americans live than any other area. They are sedentary, meaning they don't move around as much, and so this is contributing to some of their chronic diseases. Um, and it's possible that BMI formulas are not as accurate due to differences in body structure, such as bone density. There are high rates of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, anemia, which is reduction in red blood cells, or inability to carry oxygen due to some sort of red blood cell deficiency, iron deficiency, um, B12 deficiency, folate deficiency. They have high calorie intakes. I mentioned that snacking is still very common in African American cultures, but when you think of snack foods, you don't think of too many that are healthy, especially the quick affordable ones. And so this has negatively contributed to their health and they often report limited access to health care. So unfortunately, with assimilation, immigration of Africans to America, their traditional diets were kind of rejected and lost, and they're eating very Americanized food, but even at the extreme levels, and this is causing them many health discrepancies. So I believe that that is all I have to say. Um, in conclusion, this is a huge country, second largest continent, 
rich of all sorts of history, different regions. Um, it is common to eat with the hands, the right. They do like starchy foods and sticky foods such as porridges and these sticky breads. Meats are common. Pork is very common in some regions. Chicken is often valued in some regions. Vegetables are used. Fruits are used, but not to as great of an extent. Corn is very popular. Cassava, plantains, millet are often staples. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and it has maybe inspired you to travel to Africa or try some African foods. Um, there is a Moroccan restaurant in San Luis Obispo that's quite good. In Santa Barbara, there's an Ethiopian restaurant that's quite delicious. Like I mentioned, I have been to Morocco, but since Africa is such a large continent, I would love to explore other areas of Africa. So maybe sometime in my future, I will. All right, thank you for listening. Goodbye. Also, excuse the slight technical strangeness in the middle of the presentation.